Father, thank you for these words. Set a guard over my mouth that I would not say anything you have not given. And unite our hearts to fear your name because you are the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, which is saying to you. So bind up all of our thoughts. Teach us in the name of Christ, we pray. When I was young, I had adopted, I think not because I was taught it, but just I somehow picked it up, a rather unhelpful view of the Old Testament. And maybe you could resonate with this. I saw the Old Testament as a bunch of rules to be followed and a bunch of people to emulate. I call it kind of the Veggie Tales response to the Old Testament. Okay. So, obviously, there are rules that are given in the Old Testament and a lot of people that you'd want to emulate, like King David. Honor the Jewish laws, follow God like King David did. Problem is, this did not work out so well. You look a little closer at David's life, and you have this guy that's a man after God's own heart and leads the nation of Israel in worship and is a man of prayer. And like, oh, these are great things emulate, but he's also a murderer and an adulterer and a deceiver and a really absent father. And the more that I read about these things, I, I started feeling uncomfortable. Like, oh, I don't know that I really want to emulate David a whole lot. I think it got even stranger when I was in college and I still kind of had this idea of the Old Testament. And a friend of mine was getting a tattoo. Actually, she already did get a tattoo, and I, uh, it was a little late for me to say anything to her, but it's already, it's already there. And I pointed out to her chapter and verse from the Old Testament why getting a tattoo is against God's design for us. She was not very happy with me. And in my righteousness was thinking, well, of course you're not going to be happy sometimes when we sin and we have it pointed out. It's, it's not a good thing. So she responded with a letter. And in the letter, she asked me if I wore my hair and clothes the same way as Jewish men are required to wear their hair and clothes. In the Old Testament, I don't have big side curls and I don't wear tassels on the end of my robe. Um, <clears throat> and so she pointed out that I also was in violation of the Old Testament by my dress code and I better shape up. <clears throat> so that's a rather frustrating experience because what are we supposed to do with the Old Testament then? Have you ever had these kinds of frustrations? There's some really strange things in that set of books. Because at best, it seems that we are to pick and choose what we take and what we set aside. And if this is something that we're saying God wrote and God inspired, that doesn't seem like a really good method to approach those books. And so what a lot of Christians do is they ignore it completely. Except for flannel graph in Sunday school. That's how we treat it, like, these are some good stories to kind of wet your whistle and get you going in the Bible so that when you get older and more mature, you can graduate into the New Testament and then you can actually learn something. There's actually a very prominent pastor, still prominent today, who just a few years ago said that we need to unhinge ourselves from the Old Testament, just like the apostles unhinged themselves from the Old Testament and were no longer slaves to it. He said that it should not be the go-to source for a Christian to learn how to do life. He made a lot of waves at that, and a lot of people were frustrated by that, rightly so. So I think it's safe to say there's a lot of confusion around the Old Testament. How many of you have read particularly in the Old Testament and just been befuddled and, um, and confused? Anybody else? That's most of the hands in this room. My contention for the reason why the Old Testament is so difficult is because we have misunderstood what it is and why it's important. And the reason I'm even bringing this up this morning and having a whole message on this, this question of why does the Old Testament matter is because we're in this series, 
which is really a series on hermeneutics. How do we understand the Bible? What is the science of interpretation? And if, and if you've been in the second hour, you know this word hermeneutics, and it's not a big million-dollar word for you anymore. But God wrote a book. And this is one of the primary ways that he has chosen to reveal himself to us is through this book. So first we started with the question, why does the Bible matter from Psalm 1? It matters because when you engage with God's words, it actually transforms your soul. It transforms your life. Then we looked at the question of what is the Bible? We looked at that last week. Specifically, what is it? It's a collection of books. It's more of a library of books that were written over a span of 1,600 years by 40 different authors. And, and, it, and it's all saying something specific. And so today, as we dive into that a little deeper, why does the Old Testament matter? And what's really interesting is I've chosen to answer this question about the Old Testament by looking at a portion of the New Testament. You're scratching your head a little bit on that? So as we fight for interpretation, here's one of the things you need to understand. One of the ways that people go in error in the church is when they read the Old Testament through an Old Testament lens and don't read it through a New Testament lens. So what we will see today, in, in, in large part, is that the Old Testament sets up a foundation for us of what's coming in the New Testament, and the New Testament is the lenses through which we read the Old Testament. So the two are hand in hand. You need the two together. Old Testament sets it up. The New Testament gives us a framework for understanding. So today we're going to look at the book of Hebrews, which was a letter circulated to a group of people. I give you one guess what the group of people was. Anybody? Book of Hebrews? Who was it written to? Hebrews, Jewish people. We make books of the Bible really, really difficult. Like the, the letter to the Galatians was written to who? Right, that's, it's, really, it's really simple. A letter written to Jewish people. We do not know who the author of Hebrews was. We have speculations about who it might have been. might have been the Apostle Paul himself. It might have been Apollos. We don't know. What we do know is that this had to have been a Jewish person or someone steeped in Jewishness writing to Hebrew Christians about why the Old Testament still matters and how Jesus actually is the focal point of the entire Old Testament. Everything that the Jewish people did was actually about Jesus and pointing to Jesus and suffused by Jesus. And so Hebrews at a glance, one of the big things Hebrews is trying to communicate to us is that God actually speaks. He talks. This is a radical notion. It's radical because in human history... The idea of God speaking has led to a lot of problems. You understand? Especially when someone says that God has spoken, but God actually didn't speak to them. So do you remember this thing called the Crusades, where a bunch of people who called themselves Christians mounted horses with their swords and rode from Europe all the way to Jerusalem and took Jerusalem back? Why? Because a pope decided that God wanted Christians to retake Jerusalem. God did not tell the Pope to retake Jerusalem and kill a whole bunch of Muslims. Uh, that didn't happen. Adolf Hitler believed that God was speaking to him when he organized the Nazi party. Uh, Islamic Jihad today is, is done in the name of God. Did you get what I'm saying? Like This is a common occurrence that the people say, God spoke to me and this is what we're supposed to do. And the problem is that frequently or almost all the time, God didn't speak to them. In some circles today, if you say that God is speaking to you, you can get yourself committed to a mental ward. <laughs> it's that serious. There was a um, primetime television show that didn't last very long, but the, the, the premise was interesting. This is just a few years ago. A drunk woman chokes and dies, and she has a conversation with God, and God sends her back to earth. But when she comes back to earth, she now has the ability to hear God speak. And so the whole premise of this sitcom is all the trouble that you get into if you actually hear God's voice. And so what network television was telling us is that listening to God's voice is actually a funny thing. It's laughable. It gets you into trouble. 
So listen, when the author of Hebrews says that God speaks, it's not talking about our culture's strange, mocking sense of God. It's not talking about people who are Fruit Loops who say God said to, to, to murder six million Jews. We're not talking about that kind of speech. We're talking about something more grand than this, way better than a weeknight sitcom. So the author of Hebrews actually parses this out for us in the introduction to the book. Remember, Hebrews is steeped in Old Testament, and so it's relying upon the speech of God to even make the point. So, as the author introduces the book, not only says God speaks, second, he says God has spoken through frail humans. Do you see that phrase? Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. Now, we started by talking about the difficulty that we have with the Old Testament often. Um, why is it difficult? Well, first, it's really old. So if you want to get behind the authors of the New Testament and what they're doing, like when Paul writes his letter to the Galatians or when, when John's writing Revelation, there's culture in that. We have to get back to 2,000 years before our time to understand their culture so we can understand those texts. That's, that's wild and woolly. We'll now go back 4,000 years, 5,000 years, 6,000 years, culturally speaking, for some of these stories. It gets challenging. And it's not only challenging because of that, it's also challenging because it's filled with prophets who say and do some really strange things. That's where you get tripped up when you're reading the Old Testament. So when God called an Old Testament saint to become a prophet, these people understood that they were not signing up for an easy life. So Jeremiah, for instance, he was uh, called the reluctant prophet. Did you know that? So when you're reading Jeremiah, just have in mind that this is a reluctant prophet. God called him, and he was not really excited to be called. Why? Listen to his job description, okay? You can jot this down. You can read it later again. Jeremiah chapter 1, verses 17 through 19. When God called him, he said, You dress yourself for work. Get ready. This is going to be hard. Buckle in. Arise, say to them, meaning my people, everything I command you, do not be dismayed by them, lest I dismay you before them. And I, behold, I make you this day, Jeremiah, a fortified city, an iron pillar, and bronze walls against the whole land, against the kings of Judah, its officials, its priests, and the people of the land. They will fight against you, but they shall not prevail against you. For I am with you, declares the Lord, to deliver you. Do you think that Jeremiah, when God is saying this, and he's saying, I'm going to make you a fortified city, a bronze pillar, is thinking, pray tell, why do I have to be this? Because God says the people are not going to listen to you. It's going to be like hitting your head into an iron door over and over and over again. And this is what I'm asking you to do. This is not an easy thing when God calls someone to be a prophet. And so, in Hebrews, the author says this, that God used them to speak in many parts and in many ways. That's my translation. Many parts and many ways. What does that mean? Well, it's communicating two things. Here's the first thing, many parts. Each prophet revealed a part or a piece of who God was. A part or a piece. Do you remember in Genesis that God created Adam and Eve, and whereas the rest of creation was declared to be good, when he created Adam and Eve, he said it is very good. This is the pinnacle of creation, because I've made these two beings who are like me in so many ways. They have attributes of me, God says. And I I made them my vice regents, my rulers on planet Earth. They're to rule in my stead and take care of this land that I have created. And one of the main reasons why they're able to do this is a bird is a bird because it is a bird. It does what a bird does. It flies. It it lays eggs. It makes nests. It's, It's an instinctive thing. It just does what God created it to do. God created human beings to do all this by knowing him, by having an intimate relationship with him. 
human beings, just like a bird flies and a bird makes nest, human beings are created to instinctively know God and have fellowship with God. Do you understand this? This is how you were made. And Adam and Eve chose to break that and rebel against that. Can you imagine what would happen if a bird decided to just break and rebel against the fact that it can fly? I'll tell you what happens. A coyote eats it. It doesn't work well. And so Adam and Eve broke this. They just decided that we don't want this anymore. This is not going to be a part of who we are anymore. And so it forever changed the fabric of humanity. But that doesn't mean that our createdness has gone away. You see? We don't do it, but it hasn't gone away. It's still there. We were created for this, and God knows this. And so what God does in the midst of human rebellion is he decides to send messengers who write down their messages, and we're these dense creatures. We, we're afraid of God now. We don't know him. And so in his compassion to us, he decides little by little through 1,600 years in writing this book to give us pieces and parts of who he is. Little by little. So, he's reintroducing us to himself. Did you see this? So Moses writes the first five books of the Old Testament. And one of the most prominent things that Moses does here is he outlines God's laws, his decrees, what he expects from human beings that have been created in his image. If you're created in my image, this is how you are to live. Do you see? Because I'm a God of laws. I'm a God of rights and I'm a God of wrongs. Did you see there's a, this part that Moses is displaying to us of God? Or Isaiah. Isaiah says a lot of things, but one of the main things that he communicates is that God is a God of holiness. He is set apart from all creation because he created all of creation and there's no sin to be found in him. That's why when Isaiah is in his presence, Isaiah understands who he is as a human being. Do you remember what Isaiah says? Woe is me, I'm ruined. I'm a man of unclean lips from a people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the glory of God. I'm going to die. And God says, don't freak out. <clears throat> You're okay. So we get that peace of God, this holiness, or Amos speaks to us of God being a God of justice. He cares about the oppressed. He cares about those who can't get ahead. Or Hosea, who speaks to us about God's forgiving law. And so we get all these pieces that are given to us as God reintroduces himself to us in his book. That's the first thing that's communicated by his many parts, but then there's also the many ways. So each prophet reveals these pieces in some really distinct ways, which some of them are lost on us because we have so many thousands of years of history. They weren't lost upon the people of those days. So for Hosea, God says to this righteous man, do you see that prostitute, Hosea? Marry her. And Hosea says, excuse me? Because this wasn't a reformed woman. This is a woman still plying her trade. He says, marry her. And when she continues to ply her trade, and Hosea has every right in the room to in the world to divorce her and send her on her way, God says, No, go take her back. And he takes her back. And they have kids and they make a family, and she goes and plies her trade again, and God says, Nope, take her back, take her back, take her back. This is one of the ways through which God shows us that He is God the forgiver, the one who is gracious and loving, even when we have turned our back on God. How would you like to be Hosea? Well, if you think that's a little strange, how about Ezekiel? Um, in Ezekiel chapter 4, 1 through 3, God tells Ezekiel to go in the midst of the people and build a model of Jerusalem. Little soldiers to surround the city. And through building a model in the middle of the city as an adult, God displays to the people his great compassion and fairness and that he's going to send the people back to Jerusalem because they're in captivity. Or Isaiah, this is, uh, how would you like to be in Isaiah's shoes? God actually told him for three years, don't wear clothes. Even when you go into town. Make it as a jaybird. And actually through this, 
He shows them how he's going to punish Egypt and Ethiopia. And, and through the nakedness, God actually displays that he's the rescuer who's come to, to, to save his people. Do you see? So you have all these pieces of God that are being revealed in these different ways. The bottom line is that these are human agents, and so these are incomplete communicators. Do you see? that They're only able to reveal pieces and portions of who God is. I, one of my favorite um, biographies is of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It's written by a man named Eric Metaxas. Eric Metaxas was not even born when Dietrich Bonhoeffer died. And so is, is, is Eric Metaxas a, uh, a, 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 a perfect person to tell us about Dietrich Bonhoeffer? Absolutely not. If you want to know perfectly about Dietrich Bonhoeffer, you should be alive before 1945 and actually speak to him, have coffee with him. He'd be great. So there's an incompleteness to what Eric Metaxas is able to reveal. We need Bonhoeffer. So too, God says through the author of Hebrews, God spoke through these frail humans, but, but, and here's the point of the rest of the book of Hebrews. Actually, if you keep reading in Hebrews, God has spoken perfectly through his son, Jesus Christ. Verse 2, but in these last days, by the way, do you know when the last days are? According to the scriptures? Now, you are living in the last days. The last days are from when Jesus' feet left the Mount of Ascension to when his feet come back down. You're living in the last days right now. So he says, in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. So what the author is saying is that Jesus did not come to reveal a portion of God. He didn't come to reveal a part here, a part there. Jesus came to show us God completely. So Jesus himself said to his disciples in Matthew 13, 17, he said, truly I say to you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. So those same prophets, naked Isaiah, Ezekiel, building his little model. Hosea, married to the prostitute. As they're sharing these bits and pieces of Jesus, they longed to know what this was all aiming at. To know what they were talking about. And what they saw in part, Jesus says, we see fully. Because what they were describing in part was, in fact, Jesus. That's what they were getting at was Jesus. So when Jesus speaks, God speaks. When Jesus acts, God acts. In the great spiritual mystery, when Jesus died on the cross for the sins of the world, the second member of the Trinity died. So if you want to hear God's voice, you've got to listen to the voice of Jesus, because Jesus is God. His final word to a race that's totally lost. So that's why the author of Hebrews in verse 3, if you have your Bibles open, we've done verse 1, verse 2. Look at verse 3. He says, Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. That's a, just a really fancy way to say, when you saw Jesus, if you were alive 2,000 years ago and you looked at Jesus, you were literally looking at God, literally hearing God speak. You see, the whole point of Hebrews is to tell us that Jesus' voice is not just in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Not just in the epistles or the book of Acts. That, that he appears actually all over the Bible. This is why the author of Hebrews places Jesus at the beginning of the world. The author of Hebrews says Jesus created the world. He wasn't just there, he created it. And so if we find him there, we should expect to find him also in Exodus. And we should expect to find him in Joshua and 2 Samuel and in Psalm and Proverbs and in Ezekiel and Malachi. We should expect to find Jesus everywhere throughout the Old Testament. Why? Well, there's a passage that we looked at earlier this summer as we were walking through 1 Peter that helps us understand what's going on here. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 10-12. through 12, And I would invite you to open it and, and turn it there and mark this up. <laughs> Underline, make notes in what we're about to read because this is a fundamentally important passage as we try to understand the Old Testament. 1 
1 Peter chapter 1, and we begin reading at verse 10, okay? Concerning this salvation, the prophets... Now, remember, Peter has been talking about the gospel, talking about the salvation of Jesus and what has happened through his life, death, resurrection, ascension. Peter's making sense of this, helping these suffering Christians to make sense of this. He says, concerning this salvation you've been given, listen to this, the prophets... In parentheses, put Old Testament by that. Just parentheses, OT. The prophets who prophesied about the grace that was to be yours, you see that they prophesied about Jesus is what they're saying. When you say the grace that is to be yours, right in parentheses, Jesus. Searched and inquired carefully, inquiring what person or time the Spirit of Christ in them, underline that, the Spirit of Christ in them was indicating when he predicted the sufferings of Christ and the subsequent glories. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things into which angels long to look. Here's what... Peter is saying, this good news that gives you hope to keep going in the midst of suffering, this thing was actually slowly revealed through the eons of human history by God to human agents by the Spirit of Jesus, bit by bit, from 6,000 A.D. and on. Who was behind the Old Testament? Jesus. That's what he's saying here. That God, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, has been orchestrating this from the very first moment that an oral history was handed to Moses, and Moses, under inspiration of the Spirit of Jesus, begins writing down his accounts in Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and then passes it on to Joshua, and then to whoever wrote Judges, and Ruth, First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles. Here's where your Awana kids comes up. It's the Spirit of Jesus propelling these things. And this is why we said last week that it is better that you have the Bible than to have Jesus right in front of you. Why? There's a passage from last week that we did not spend a lot of time scrutinizing, but it's important. Remember I said, it is better that you have this book than to have Jesus standing in front of you speaking. Why? Look what it says. For prophecy never had its origin in human will, but prophets, though human spoke from God as they were, do you see this under here? Carried along by the Holy Spirit. And the radical thing that happens in the New Testament is not just that the second member of the Trinity became a human, not just that he lived a sinless life, the life that we should have lived, so he lived our life for us, not just that he died our death for us, not just that he was raised from the dead, making a way for our sins to be forgiven, but the scriptures tell us in the New Testament over and over again that the Holy Spirit now permanently resides in the lives of those who have received the gift of Christ and his cross and his resurrection, which means the same Holy Spirit, follow me here, the same Holy Spirit that guided Ezekiel, that helped David write his psalms, that told Moses to write down these words is living inside of you. And so when you, we talked about this last week in second hour, come to him humbly and pray and ask him to reveal himself to you in this book, you have a level of understanding here that you would not have if Jesus were standing right in front of you because Jesus himself lives inside of you now. Mine goes, <clears throat> you duct tape to hold the gray matter in. <clears throat>
And so what God's doing in the Old Testament is setting up the revelation of Jesus. And so that doesn't clear up the fact that we've got to go through several thousand years of history to understand some of the cultural things. But listen, you can do this. It becomes second nature the more you engage with it. And when you do the hard work and you find Jesus in the Old Testament, you will not forget. You'll be reading there and you'll go, oh my goodness, and you'll connect something that Paul said or that Peter said or that John said or that the author of Hebrews said with this Old Testament text that you're reading, and all of a sudden you see it, and it's like it's like this veil is torn from your eyes, and you go, Jesus is there. Let me give you an example. Do you remember that after Adam and Eve sin, and you know, Adam says it's that woman, she did it, and the woman says it's that serpent, you made this snake, and, and he did it, and everybody's passing the buck, and all this horror breaks down and God pronounces judgment, judgment upon the man and woman and then he pronounces judgment upon the serpent which is really judgment upon Satan. And he says these words. He says, uh, so the Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly. You will eat dust all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman between your offspring and her offspring. Now listen, he's not just talking to snakes. This is a judgment speaking about what's going to happen to Satan eventually. All of this this horror has been pronounced, that that, that they're separated from God, that they must die, that that their, their very family is going to be shattered by sin, that there's going to be this fight between men and women. Do you see this today? A fight between men and women, who gets to be the boss? And men lord their leadership over the women, and that's stupid, but that's the way they do it now because they're sinful, and women are trying to usurp the leadership, and children come in the mix, and they're disobedient, and all this stuff happens, and all this chaos breaks loose, and Adam and Eve have to be completely devastated at this point by what has happened. Not to mention that in a few verses, God is going to take the very animals that they were supposed to protect, and he's going to slaughter them, and he's going to put their fur on their backs. I think it would have made Adam and Eve want to vomit with the notion of, this is the, 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 the animal, this is the sheep that I loved and cared for, and now its skin is on my back to keep me alive. You see the horror of this moment. In the horror of this moment, as God puts a pronouncement upon the serpent, really upon Satan, he says... In the hearing of Adam and Eve, listen to me, Eve, do not despair. Someone is coming from your offspring. And look at the rest of the text. This one that comes from your womb will crush the head of the snake and the snake will strike his heel. What in the world is he talking about? I mean, Adam and Eve have a couple boys, Cain and Abel. Maybe he's talking about them. And then Cain rises up in anger and strikes his brother in the head and crushes his skull and Abel dies. And Cain is sent off into exile. And Adam and Eve have to think, well, there goes that. No offspring. And they give birth to another boy. He dies. It's not talking about him. Generation after generation, who's this talking about? Who's this talking about? Who do you think this is talking about? The one that will crush the head of the serpent, but in doing so will be wounded in his body by the serpent. Who's this talking about? Jesus, say it louder. Who's it talking about? Jesus. You see these things in the Old Testament and the shroud is taken from your eyes. This is actually called the Proto-Euangelion, the very first gospel. This is our first hint that God is going to do something to undo the horror of our sin. Right there, Genesis 3, when it all begins, God has a plan. Jesus is there in Genesis 3, verse 15. Take it to the bank. So if you want to know my story, I've alluded to this numerous times over 15 years. Part of how I started understanding the Old Testament was actually graduating from a Christian college in which I had 
Bible courses and still didn't really understand the Old Testament beyond Veggie Tales. Veggie Tales are great, they're funny, but it's just moralism. It doesn't tell you how to read your Bibles. It really kind of reinforces the David was good, be like David, because Junior Asparagus is David in this particular episode. If you don't know what I'm talking about, just go look up Veggie Tales, David and Goliath, or whatever it is. So I got to seminary, and the, the reality is, what I'm about to say may reinforce to you that you can't understand the Bible without seminary, poppycock, ridiculousness. So what I'm about to tell you, I did not need to go to seminary for. It just happened that either I wasn't paying attention in the good church I grew up in, or my professors in my Bible college were not doing a good enough job of relaying this information. Or maybe I was just too dense to get it, I don't know. All of the above. Scripture came alive because no one had ever connected the dots for me. From Genesis to Revelation, 66 books over 1,600 years, every single book pointing to Jesus. Story of human rebellion and the consequences of rebellion and that God is sending a rescuer and I saw the unparalleled beauty of what God has done, what he's currently doing, what he's going to do, and that he actually is using me. I'm actually a part of this story that began in Genesis. So here, here's a good framework for you to unlock the Old Testament. You're just thinking, well, how, how do I do this? Listen. In the Old Testament, God presents a moral code that he expects every single human being to follow. There is a moral law that is there. And what we see is that we are too sinful to keep this moral law. In fact, his own people that he established are too sinful to keep the moral law. We all fall short of the moral law. We need a rescuer to come and save us from this heart condition. And so what God does is he establishes a nation. He keeps following the covenant through. You have, you have, you have Adam and Eve, and it passes on to, to, to their son, and it passes on to, to Noah, and it passes on to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, scoundrels, really awful human beings in many respects, but they had enough faithfulness to keep the covenant going until finally a nation is established, and when Moses comes to lead this people, God says to them, you are a special set-apart people, and you are to obey my moral code. Yes, but I'm going to add on to you a ceremonial code. You're to dress differently. You're to speak differently. You're to eat differently. You're to worship differently. You are not to get tattoos. You're to wear fringes on your robes. You are to grow your hair in a funky way. Guys, you're to cut your bodies in a certain way. There's all these things God says is a ceremonial. It's given to these people for this time and this place. Why? Because God was using these imperfect people to set them apart to do something specific, mainly to bring his son into the world. Usually the Old Testament is that story. And my challenge to you this morning is that you're never going to get that story. You're never going to have those Genesis 3.15 aha moments if you ignore it and never read it. Never. And the New Testament's going to be incomplete to you because the writers are going to say things that they assume you know because you've been reading the Old Testament. Because they're audience knew these things, do you see? Peter, a stubborn blue-collar fisherman, almost certainly had the first five books of the Old Testament memorized. Because that was normal for every boy. The Apostle Paul had the entire Old Testament canon memorized because that's what a Pharisee did. Do you see how contingent this is? We, we need to have this, and we need to know it. And I ask you the question, why do we need to know this story? Isn't it good enough that we have you to tell us about the story on Sunday morning? No, it's not. These are God's words. They're important. And because we have them, we can make sense of things.
Let me give you three headlines, local headlines. These are not national news or world news headlines. Three local headlines. Mother abandons children three and one for ten days. Children starve. This is a local story. Sioux Falls man given three life sentences for sex trafficking in Sioux Falls. Fold a high school student killed in a car accident. But what do we do with this stuff? How do we make sense of this stuff? Where is there hope? If this is our local news, this isn't Ukraine, this isn't China, this is here. God has given us an account of his activity through human history. And this account is all about how he is saving us from ourselves. Because you and I need to be saved from ourselves. It's an account of how he is restoring the proper order of God as the ruler, not us. The message from start to finish is Jesus. So let me suggest to you that the Old Testament fundamentally matters. C.S. Lewis don't ask me which writing this is in. It might be mere Christianity. Wisely said, Christianity of false is of no importance. And of true is of infinite importance. The only thing it cannot be is moderately important. Do you see? So decide for yourself today. See, God is speaking. He speaks all the time. He speaks in nature telling us he's here, but he speaks most concertedly in this book. He has spoken. The rescuer is here. Jesus is our perfect prophet. Jesus is our only priest communicating to God on our behalf, and he's our king. And so learning to read and understand this book is fundamentally important. It can't be moderately important. Do you see? So in the second hour, we're going to dive headfirst today into how to read it. Just to read it. We're not even getting to study yet. Read. Reading Genesis through Revelation because it's all God's speech and it's all about Jesus. Let's pray. Father, my hope, and I pray that your spirit might grant this, is that we would be a people who understand several things, who understand that your word is of fundamental importance who also understand that it is clear, it is able to be understood, it is not too difficult for any of us, and that most of us, if not all of us, have been lazy in our approach to it and taken it for granted, while our brethren around the world are getting scraps of it, a piece of Genesis, half of the Gospel of John and committing it to memory as quickly as possible because the authorities are going to take it away and we need to ingest it quickly. While that is happening to our brethren around the world, we have unparalleled access to it and Satan has deluded us into believing it's not important. And so move in us. Do a great work in our church. A revival of your word in our lives. Not for the sake of just gaining a head full of facts, but of knowledge, true, pure knowledge. Knowledge that is some facts and figures, but also is an experience of you in the scriptures. And we go to Genesis 3.15 and we see Jesus is there. And he's in 1 Samuel, and he's in Malachi, and he's in the Gospels, and he's in the letters, and he's in the Apocalypse. He's in everything. Father, when we are cut, let us bleed Bible and transform us through it, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I'd encourage you to come to second hour, and literally we're going to talk about just reading it, just reading the Word of God, what that looks like and why it's important. Um, but we'll go to the end of Hebrews, this whole book about Jesus and how he shows up in the Old Testament, finishes with this benediction. Let's say it together. Now may the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with everything good for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. Reminder, um, in about 20 minutes, please bring your children up to their Sunday school room and make sure the teacher has seen you, make eye contact with them so we know where the kids are.